It's uh, 910 Big 550 KTRS. Uh, last week, or I guess uh, on Friday, uh, ESPN the magazine, their new edition uh, was out. And the cover story is uh, of Alex Rodriguez. The story is the education of Alex Rodriguez. And uh, written by uh, my cousin JR. It is the talk of the baseball world. And we have a chance. He's got a couple minutes. So he's nice enough to come and uh, join us again. Good morning, JR. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, good. Good morning, cousin. Uh, all right, so only you can spend six months with the most talked about uh, athlete in the country. Everyone wants to know what he says. ESPN gives you 12,000 words to say it, and you don't quote him once. <laughs> and I had very good reasons for doing it. Um, yes. The first reason, of course, was that uh, a lot of the time that I was with him, um, it was off the record. He just is very guarded. As you can imagine, the media has not been kind to him, uh, all of which he brought on himself. But so I often was not able to bring out a tape recorder or a notebook. And um, so later I had to negotiate those conversations back onto the record. Um, but I was quoting him, you know, after the fact. I, after I would be with him, I would text myself some of the things he said, or I'd write, jot them down or text my editor. But I don't believe in putting those kinds of things in quote marks. Unless you write it down in real time, it's not an exact, exact quote. There's just an extra level of care that I take with quotes. Right. Um, secondly, as I say in the story, and all of this methodology is explained in the story, um, he's just unquotable. He's lied so many times in the past that the minute you, you type those quote marks, you can feel the reader cringing, and I could feel myself cringing. I just I, I thought that uh, quotes would just immediately alienate readers, and I didn't want that. I wanted readers to see what I was seeing, to watch him uh, uh, live his life, and, uh, and, and I, there was real effort there to atone and to become a better person. I thought no one would see that. No one would give that story a chance to evolve over 12,000 words if they were just, you know, focused on what he said. And, and thirdly, you know how it is in the media. If I wrote a 12,000-word story, the only thing anyone would read would be the quotes. Uh, people would just rip that stuff out like the guts from a fish, and they'd throw the fish aside. And that's all you'd hear, and it would be a one-day story. People would feast on those excerpted quotes. And no one would, no one would ever look at the scenes, the the observations, the the, the things his friends were telling me, uh, just off the record. It just wouldn't get through the noise, the white noise around this guy. So, those are the three biggest reasons, and there were other smaller reasons. And um, I mean, I'm very happy with the decision, and and readers don't seem thrown by it at at all. No, uh, it, no. It, what, it, now let me ask, what about ESPN? How hard was it to get ESPN to sign off? on this in a story in which there are no quotes. I have a great editor at ESPN, Raina Kelly, and uh, the minute I told her I'm thinking about doing this with no quotes, we had a good laugh about it. But then, you know, she was completely in. Um, and that's, that's just one of her many wonderful qualities. She said, let's try it. Let's see how it reads. And um, the, on that first draft, we, we agreed. There's no other way to do this. Um, but, uh, I mean... Each of those reasons that I just gave you, on its own, right. would be a good enough reason. When you put them together, we realized in the first draft, there's no other way to go. This isn't some aesthetic, creative choice we're making. We're really in a box here with this guy. Um, and so we were, from that, from that first draft on, we, we were very kind of um, relaxed about that decision. Um, and the, bo the bosses at ESPN, after they recovered from the initial shock, a 12,000-word profile with no direct quotes, um, they were great with it, too. And um, what people have to understand when they read the story is, yeah, there are no direct quotes, quote-unquote <laughs> direct quotes, but there are quotes. I mean, um, this, is a, this is, again, a level of care and precaution that I take with right. exact quotes. If I'm not writing it down or recording it as you're saying it, I don't put it in quotes. But that is not to say that, w that what I say he says in the story is not exactly what he says. Maybe there's a word off. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe here or there I didn't remember it exactly right. Um, but but I, have, you, have you ever heard of somebody doing a story like this before? I mean, that's pretty gutsy to go out and do that. I have not. Uh, we talked about that, and I, I have not heard of that being done. Yeah. Um, the, only, the only hesitation I had is that sometimes he would let me type and while he was talking, and, and we had phone conversations that were on the record, and and um, 
So there are exact quotes in there, and I, you know, I thought about putting those in quote marks, but that would be way too distracting. Some quotes would be in quote marks, and some wouldn't be. Right. And, and, and when I would think about doing that, I would get back to my other reasons about how unquotable he is and, and, and what the media would do. It just, they would frack the story for quotes. They would strip mine it. So every time I had a hesitation, I realized that there really was no other way. And the fact that no one had done it before, that wasn't daunting because, I mean, right. you know, there always has to be a first time for everything. Um, so so J.R. Moringer, our guest cousin, uh, New York Times bestseller, Pulitzer Prize winner. You need to teach people how to say the word Pulitzer. Um, <laughs> the Tender Bar, uh, Agassiz's book, the Sutton, uh, and the cover story this week of ESPN the magazine. It, it's online, ESPN.com, as well as in uh, newsstands everywhere. All right. One of the things you touch on, and I've been saying this for years, and you really sort of flush it out a little bit in this article, and that is is that there's a disconnect with this PED scandal and that the media has vilified these guys, M- McGuire, Bonds, you name it, uh, Alex Rodriguez, and the fans themselves, you have seen firsthand that he walks down the street and people love him, but the media hates him. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um I mean, I guess people don't need to be reminded that the media hates him and, and all these guys. But when you're following him around and you're researching him, you really are, and your, your job is to read everything that's written about him, you are really taken aback. Um, the way he's written about it is so disproportionate to the crimes. Um, the, the, the vitriol, the, you know, calling him evil and the devil, and, I mean, it, it's, it's just out of whack. And I think... That's part of the reason that fans have tuned it out. And you walked, I've walked with him in Miami, in San Francisco, in, in L.A., in New York, and uh, I never heard a bad word said to him by someone on the street uh, or in public. Um, people, are, they smile at him, they wave at him, they uh, tell him good luck this year. Um, it's, it's stunning. You would, think, you would think there would be some kind of in-between there where you'd hear some negative something or other from a person on the street or a fan. It never happened. But uh, then you turn to the day's news, and and you just you feel like you're with a war criminal. So uh, there is a disconnect there. I can't really account for it except to say that there are writers uh, who have a vested interest in the narrative of this guy's a villain, this guy's a hero, and uh, I guess I mean I guess that sells papers, magazines. I guess that you know that triggers uh, clicks on your website or your blog. Um, but uh, I mean that that seems like um, that, that seems like a poor reason to just keep pursuing that narrative. Never mind how unethical it is. It's just so lazy. Um, yeah, the guy's done terrible things, and I'm not excusing him. I'm not. I'm not. It's not my job to excuse him or forgive him. But I mean, uh, people have done far worse things than this guy, and they've been welcomed back into the fold of society. They hold elective office. They. Um, they, they, you know, they they play whatever sport they've been banned from. This, this guy served the longest suspension in baseball history. Now he's coming back, and you read writers, uh, you know, who are deeply offended that he would dare to come back after his suspension. I, I don't really, I don't really get it. You bring up Ryan Braun, in which people forget Ryan Braun's story. When you talk about things that were way way worse, Ryan Braun should be vilified. And I, and to some extent, he is. Um, and some people will never forgive Ryan Braun, and you know, and that's that's their right. And I, I understand that I'm not wearing a Ryan Braun jersey, but um, there's so much more hate for Alex Rodriguez. And uh, after spending six months off and on, reading about him, following him, getting you know, getting a glimpse of the the inside of his life, I don't I don't get it uh, except that. There's like this huge convergence of factors with him. It's the Yankees. It's the fact that he's signed these, you know, uh, $500 million worth of contracts. It's uh, the fact that he date, dated movie stars. Um, it's the fact that he dissed Jeter. It's the fact that he's had the worst PR instincts, um, maybe of any public figure in the last 25 years. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but that doesn't, that doesn't make it true. Um, I just don't think his sins rise to the level of uh, the way that the tabs in New York, the media generally, the baseball writers uh, portray him. So when you were talking to him, J.R. Moringer with us, cousin, uh, ESPN the Magazine article about Alex Rodriguez spent uh, months with him. When you were talking to him, 
did did the other violators, the other sinful steroid users, and I'm talking about McGuire specifically, who quote unquote saved baseball, was a pariah, apologized in a quick hastened apology two or three times, and was allowed back in and forgiven. Did that conversation happen with Alex Rodriguez? We talked about other people who had gotten in trouble for performance enhancing uh, drugs, but um, he he was he he rarely rarely if ever. I mean, I'm I'm struggling to think of a time when he would use someone else's case and, and as a way of saying why are they so hard on on me. Um, he he didn't do that kind of self justifying. Um, self-pitying thing with me. If the few times that I caught him feeling sorry for himself, it was more about the the stuff in his personal life. It was about uh, growing up without a dad, or just sort of generally where his life is at. But I didn't see him um, mentioning other people and saying it's not fair. Why me and not that person? He he didn't. I have to give him credit. He wasn't he wasn't like that in my presence. Maybe he's that way with other people. Um, and McGuire's name specifically, I can't recall it coming up. We talked more about Bonds because he was working out with Barry Bonds uh, during you know part of the time that I was with him, and he was aware. Um, how could he not be? That it looked bad. That right. it made, made people laugh. You know, the two arguably the two most notorious figures of the steroid era working out together. Um, but he really didn't care. I mean, there's. It's not like people are going to hate him more. It's not possible for people to hate Alex Rodriguez more. Where would where would Barry Bonds and and Alex Rodriguez go and throw batting practice? Where would they go? A college in uh, San Francisco. Okay, all right. And uh, incredibly, it didn't attract a ton of notice at the time. Um, they they have great regard for each other. They've known each other quite a long time. It, particularly, Alex really looks up to Barry. Just he used the phrase hitting scientist. He's a hitting scientist. It was a fascinating moment where he was talking about Barry Bonds teaching him how to quiet the mind at the plate. Um, uh, it was almost like he was describing this sort of Buddhist mystic guru um, reminding him of how to keep his mind quiet and his body quiet. And, you know, if there's an irony about these two meeting and talking about how to stay fresh and healthy into your 40s, um, you know, we didn't talk about the irony. We just talked about what what Barry Bonds knows about hitting, and I mean, even Barry Bonds' biggest critics will admit he's forgotten more about hitting than most people know. Um, I think there's a very good reason why the Giants are quietly bringing him back in as a hitting instructor. The guy is uh, he is an expert. He is a scientist, um, regardless of what he's what he's done in the past. You you were given um, access that people can only dream about with a subject. Uh, including New Year's Eve. Tell me about what he was wearing New Year's Eve. He was with uh, his daughters and some longtime uh, buddies of his, and uh, the daughters wanted to have a dance party. They were going to get to stay up uh, late and watch the New Year come in, and they also wanted to have a costume party with their dad and and dad's friends, and so he sent someone to Target to buy some... um, superhero onesies and he was wearing a batman onesie all new year's eve and his buddies were wearing superman onesies and they were just they were dying laughing every time they looked at each other and it was it was hilarious but also surreal you're sitting with a rod and he's wearing um this skin tight pale purple batman onesie from target it's it doesn't happen every day um uh, and uh and it, it was a long night. I mean, we had dinner and we talked, and we would go, we would uh, do a little interviewing, and then we would go back into the the kitchen. We talked to the kids, and then we'd watch some TV. It was it was really a night when I got to know him uh, on a different level, and I think he got to know me. And I think a lot of the I think of the rapport that we developed, uh, his ability to trust me with this story. And my ability to trust him, um, it came from that night. So what superhero outfit were you wearing? I, I was wearing jeans and a sweater. That's my superhero outfit. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I have never interviewed anybody wearing a onesie. <laughs> hope, hope to never break that streak. All right, so you've seen him work out. you spent time with him. How much baseball does he have left in him? Well, uh, I think you and I talked about this. You're very skeptical of my uh, baseball eye, and you're you know you're right to be because uh, you've been around the game more than I have. I, I thought 
I thought that running, he looked like a guy uh, who's had two hip surgeries. He's working out with uh, some Olympic track team members, um, uh, and and it, it it looked rusty. He looked like he wasn't moving all that well. That was, of course, early in the summer. As I saw him getting sort of uh, more flexible as the summer went on, but I think there's still a way to go there. As far as the bat speed, though, I saw him take batting practice a couple of times, and uh, I was impressed. I, I thought the bat, the bat speed was sick. Um, granted, he's not facing live major league pitching, right. but still, it was it was pretty extraordinary to watch him hit uh, 27 balls out of uh, uh, this high school uh, field in uh, in Florida. In fact, the actual field where he played high school ball. I just I, I personally stood next to the batting cage, and um, the sound of the ball coming off the bat is something I'll never forget. It just seemed to me that he's got some life left in that bat. Uh, J.R. Moringer, uh, the article ESPN the magazine about A. Rod, and it's getting a lot of attention um, for all the things that it says and for all the things that it goes into. I I got to give you credit um, because you're right. It, they would have taken two or three quotes out of that. People would have bagged on A. Rod, and then and then they would have gone on. And so to 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 get a nuanced position and to get a nuanced um, uh, story out. You really, I mean, it takes a lot of guts, and uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty gutsy move to do, and 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 it, it actually turned out well for you. I, I thank you, I thank you very much. I because uh, I didn't I know mean, you didn't you didn't tell me that at all. You didn't say you were going to have no no quotes. No, I was afraid you'd talk me out of it. <laughs> um, and I asked a couple of sports writer colleagues. Uh, I can think of one that I talked to about it, and he said, "No way, you cannot do that." And, but it just didn't. It really didn't feel uh, like a choice. Yeah. Um, we just live in a world where. You know, if you're on the downside of a PR disaster, if your life's a train wreck, people just stop listening, and um, they just tune you out. And he's not, he's, you know, language has never been his friend. He's really, he's, he speaks two languages, and he's not comfortable in either one. So I knew that his quotes weren't going to, they weren't going to tell the story. He is not a product of, um, at this moment, the things that he says. He, as people say, actions speak louder than words. And in his case, if he's ever going to regain any of the, you know, the public's trust, it's going to be through action. It's going to be through keeping his head down, working hard, staying out of trouble. He's never going to talk his way uh, back from the hole he's dug. And uh, and so I just I figured let's yeah. watch this guy live his life rather than listen to him try and explain. Uh, what's what's what what's next for Jr. Don't know. I mean, this has been an odyssey. Six months of thinking about this and researching it and writing it and rewriting it. I. I you know, it, it ran last week, and I've barely, I've barely exhaled. So um, I just flat out don't know what comes next. Maybe I'll come see you. Yeah, well, you got you have a book to write. That is that is for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you start working on that? All right. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> this actually came out last last week. Get over yourself. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done yeah, for me I'm lately? Hard as you, McGraw. <laughs> uh, all right, Jr. Be good. Be safe. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, uh, cousin. Congrats on the work. Thanks. All right, man. Bye. ESPN the magazine. Uh, JR wrote the article. Uh, everyone's talking about it. A Rod. He spent six months with uh, A Rod. So there you go. It's. Uh, well, I'll tweet out the article. It's a really, really, really interesting article. Fan of baseball. Fan of people. Um, about A Rod. The education of Alex Rodriguez. Nine twenty-eight here. Big five fifty.